Hi, I'm Simon. Thanks for tuning in to The Ordinary Filmmaker. Subscribe to get notification of new videos like this one so you don't miss any news, rumors, gear reviews, or tutorials. And to make things just a little bit more interesting, I'm giving away a brand new Canon EOS R5 full frame mirrorless camera to one lucky viewer. Details are in the description down below or you can watch this video here. Please look at the terms and conditions as there are some age and location restrictions. And now for the news. Canon Rumors says that we're getting not one but two APS-C R-System cameras this year. Now it's not really a stretch to think that Canon will release multiple APS-C R-System cameras, but will this be the beginning of the end for the M mount? Canon Rumors goes further stating that the M50 Mark II is the last M system camera. A camera panned by most reviewers including this one for providing a mediocre update that could have been easily delivered through a firmware update. Now while still a rumor, Craig classifies this as a CR2. It comes from known sources and it's been validated. But that's it for the news. Love LEGO? Well check out my build of the LEGO NASA and Saturn V rocket. I got this for my son for his birthday, sorry, for Christmas, and we built it together. Now this is a 2000 piece set. He's six and a half years old, so he did need a little bit of help. But most of my help, as you'll see from the video, is from basically grabbing the pieces from the plate that I put them on and then putting them on the manual where he would assemble them himself. And other than a few scenes where it's a little bit difficult to snap them onto the main body, he did pretty much all the work. Now, this video really served two purposes. It was a way of me capturing Christmas moments, uh, moments with the family, and I wasn't really too worried about lighting or video because I shot it upstairs, and this area where I shot is very comfortable. We get to see outside, it's really nice, so you still get that Christmas feel. You can see the Christmas tree off to the side, and we can smell the turkey baking in the oven. But as I said, the lighting and audio is terrible, and this wasn't meant to be a YouTube video, but after I got a few comments, I decided to take what I had, <laughs> warts and all, and show you how easy it is to make a time-lapse movie and the lessons learned that I encountered and definitely don't use custom mode. So check out the video uh, if you like to watch Lego Bills or if you're a little bit curious about time-lapse or time-lapse movies. Like staying informed and learning about camera gear? Well, subscribe and choose all notifications to get notified as soon as I publish a video. But now it's time to answer your questions. Got a question for next week's video? Post it in the comment section below and I might be answering your question first next week. And now for our first question. Biography asks, have you ever heard of a Canon ILC vlogging camera? What do you think about it even though there's little information available? What Biography is referring to is something that came out on Canon Rumors on December the 26th and it talked about an ILC camera and for those of you not in the know, an ILC camera is just basically a mirrorless or DSLR camera where you can remove the lens from the camera body. It's an interchangeable lens camera. That's all it is. Let me show you a quote that I got from the patent site that put out this information. The patent describes it as providing an imaging device and photographic lens capable of facilitating optical adjustment when an imaging lens is photographed by an imaging device capable of rotating. Yeah, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? It leaves too much room for interpretation. But what they're talking about here is a vlogging camera. It definitely is a vlogging camera. It's, it's one where you can change the lenses. And this is really huge. Not many vlogging cameras or ones designed specifically for vlogging allow you to replace the lens. So that's kind of big. Now, no, no mention on what mount is being used here. But what is interesting, and let me show you some pictures, and then it'll make a lot more sense as what this thing is going to look like. And this is taken right from the patent filing itself. So in this image, we can see here that the lens attaches to a lens mount. And again, I can't tell what size sensor that is from here. It could be APS-C, most likely is, or it could be full frame. And then on the next slide here, we can see this is what it looks like. And I don't know if that's some sort of gimbal there. It would make sense that this is some sort of stabilizing gimbal that provides extra smooth stabilization for vlogging. It looks lightweight. It looks like this thing is designed for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's vlogging. So it looks very interesting. As far as specifications, we don't have any. If you wanna go ahead and take a look at the patent filing, you can. Again, it's in Japanese. Now the site itself does translate to English, and that's what I grabbed for that quote earlier, but it's just using machine translation, and it's not a very good one. So the translation leaves a lot to be well, desired in terms of what it actually means. But the pictures, as always, uh, one picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm very interested in seeing what comes of this. But again, 
this is a patent filing. And one thing about a patent filing is it's just a way of protecting their research and development. So if somebody else decides to release a product similar, they can say, look, you owe us some money, you're stepping on our patent. Doesn't mean they're actually gonna produce something like this. Or it could mean that they're producing something similar in the future and they'll borrow technology from this patent. That's really all that means. Uh, I've seen a lot of patent filings in the recent years and lenses that have a patent filing can usually take several years before they actually come out, at least once they're filed. Um, so yeah, there's that. Keld asks, how do you reduce noise in video? Apart from using fast lenses, shooting low frame rates, and keeping ISO low, how do you expose the scene properly? I really love how you've worded this. Yeah, let's do it right the first time so we don't have to fix it in post. But unfortunately, sometimes we do. So we're gonna look at this question from two viewpoints. How do we set the scene up? How do we do everything in camera and using equipment so that we don't have to worry about fixing it in post? And if we screwed up, forgot something, well, we'll address how to fix it in post as well. But I'm not gonna answer this question. Once again, I've got Moving Matt. Moving Matt. Hey everyone, welcome back to Moving Matt. Thank you to all for letting me crash this video yet again. So today's question is a very interesting one. You are wondering how to reduce noise in your videos other than just using low aperture, changing shutter speed, and keeping your ISO low. How do you expose the scene? This question can really be an it depends answer, but I will do my best to answer it in multiple ways, and hopefully you will have a better understanding when I'm finished. I will have to give you a little tour of my humble home studio to talk about lighting, and I will take you over to the computer to give you some tips for reducing noise in post. But let's go over a few things here first. At the heart of this question, you're asking about lighting, and that is going to be the bulk of what I go over, but since you mentioned ISO, let me touch on it a bit here. Raising your ISO doesn't necessarily mean you're adding noise to your shot. Underexposing your shot adds noise. ISO is digitally making your camera sensor more sensitive to light, and yes, it will add noise, but just think of it more as a measuring tool. If you're having to make your sensor more sensitive to light, then your camera is telling you you need more light in your scene. And depending on your camera's sensor and its sensitivity to light, the higher you can raise your ISO and still get a good clean image. For example, some log profiles actually look best with a higher ISO. For example, C-Log, like what I'm using right now, has a native ISO of 400, and it looks best there. Then you have bit rate, 8-bit versus 10-bit, as you can see, we can get pretty deep in the woods pretty fast, and this is called the ordinary filmmaker. I don't want to confuse you or myself. The point I am making is know your particular camera, understand what it is capable of, and know its limitations. Know how far you can turn up your ISO before the image starts to take a hit. Now let's get to the heart of your question, how to expose a scene. Well the simple answer is expose for your subject, and it depends. I know I'm not exactly making this easy for you or myself, but that really is a big part of the answer. If you're trying to expose for the sky, you will have to crush your shadows. If your subject is in the shadows, then you will have to blow out your sky. But the way you framed your question around noise makes me think that you may be having some trouble with your lighting. So let me take you through my lighting setup and then I'll take you to the computer to give you more tips there. So ironically, when I talk about lighting, it's probably gonna be the worst lighting in this entire video. I usually do not have a mixed lighting. I do not have different colors and I do not have the top lights on. I usually just work with my three point lighting system. A lot of this part I actually wanted to refilm because it looks terrible in this lighting, but I thought it'd be a great lesson to see just how important lighting is. So just notice how much throughout this video when I move around, how the quality of the light changes the quality of the image. Sometimes before spending a whole lot of money upgrading your camera, maybe spend a little less money upgrading your lights. And so this is a basic three point lighting setup. Right here, this is my chair that I'm usually sitting on and I have my key light. Now your key light is obviously the most important, hence the word key, and that is gonna be the main light that you have on your face. And I actually use this three point lighting setup a little bit differently to get different effects, but I'll talk about that in just a minute. But you have your key light, which is gonna be the light that's gonna be closest to you. Usually it's your best light. And then you have your fill light, which is my light right here. It's not quite as expensive of a light, so I use it back here as my fill light because you're just adding a little bit of extra lighting to your, your scene or your face or whatever your subject is. So then we have back here 
is called your backlight. Now for me, I use an RGB light from Aperture and I change it to orange. And the reason I do that, it kind of gives you a little bit, I don't know if you can tell in this shot, but it'll give you almost like a rim light here. And that's your backlight. So what that is doing is it's allowing you to separate yourself or the subject or whoever you're shooting from the background. And so I actually use a couple other lights as well on the background itself because it isolates me out from the background. So now you have a light on the background and you have the three point lighting system showing me right here. So I'm isolated further out. So the reason I use orange and a little bit of teal blue is because if you've heard anything about color contrast, those are opposite on the color wheel and it just adds a little bit of color contrast along with the contrast of your regular lighting. So that is the basic lighting setup but there's a little bit more to it. There's a lot of different types of emotion that you can create with your lights and get different looks. So for example, if I hold the light right here, it kind of puts a dramatic or almost type of scary look to it. And like, for example, you think about a campfire, somebody's holding a flashlight underneath their eyes. Usually if it's darker, let me see if I can put myself over here. Usually it's darker. And then that way it'll kind of give you more of a suspenseful look. Now, if you were to put it up here, I'm pretty well lit, but usually it would also kind of give a different, more creepy style look. They use this lighting a lot in The Godfather where you couldn't see their eyes at all, kind of to give them almost a lifeless look and not a natural look at all. Now, if I back up a little bit and I get a little darker, and if I put the light right here to my side, I'm trying to create the effect with a small light, so it might be pretty difficult. But if I put the light right here to the side, let's see if I can get it right here, you'll get a slight shadow right here. And that's called Rembrandt lighting. And the reason they call it that is because of the painter. He was known for painting and he'll always have a little bit of a shadow right here. And that's how I like to use my lighting. It's kind of more of a Rembrandt style. I put the light a little bit on the side of my face and want to cast a slight shadow over here. And I only turn up my fill light just a little bit because I just want to add a little bit of light, but I want to keep that shadow. And I do that stylistically. I think it kind of looks uh, cinematic. I see like Peter McKinnon and people like that a lot of times use a similar setup, but that isn't necessarily the style that you want to have. Sometimes a lot of people that do the news have a full on bright light that they want just everywhere and see every part. That is usually like what a news station and things like that will have. But that's why it is a little bit more complicated than saying, well, just how do you light a scene or how do you expose a scene? It's because there's quite a bit more to it. You did specifically talk about noise. And for that, I'm going to take you over to the computer, show you a few of the things you can do in post to help that out. But just understand in general, the main point about exposing a scene and reducing noise is going to be the amount of light you have on your subject. So that's number one. And what you do in post is going to be number two. So let's go over to the computer. Okay, so here I am at my computer. I'm going to show you a little bit of what I do and use, but I won't be able to show you the results of it through the computer view because I don't think you'll be able to see it, but I will show you the results. Okay, here's a nice little embarrassing screen grab that we can work with, and I'll also show you as it plays because I think uh, you can see a lot of the noise move around as it's actually live. Now focus over here in the sides and you will actually see in the curtain you will see quite a bit of noise before I color grade things because I did not expose for the shadows I exposed for my subject the shadows are underexposed but I'll show you how to deal with that okay here's the screenshot I have noticed in the past when I send videos over to Simon it has to go through Dropbox's compression system and then when he puts it in his video it has to go through the compression again and then yet again when we load it on YouTube so you may see digital noise in the video no matter what but I think you can see the improvements I'm talking about here and so look at the curtains yet again this is the screenshot and I'm going to show you the before and after as you can see pretty much all the noise is gone because I crushed the shadows and I exposed properly for the subject. Now I will show you how I did that, but quickly here it is playing before and after 
and maybe you can get a better representation rather than just on a screenshot. Okay, so here's how I did this. And for the sake of time, I already have a LUT made up. This is kind of what I use in general for most of my shows. I sometimes have to tweak it just a little bit depending on if the lighting was changed or if my position was changed. As you can see here, I'm working in a plugin called Color Finale Pro, but you can do this with pretty much any color grading tool. So I'm not gonna focus on the tool. I'm gonna focus on what I'm actually doing here. Okay, so here are the color wheels. If you are in C log or a lot of different log profiles, it's best to overexpose because you can bring down the highlights and the midtones quite a bit and retain the information. But here what I've done is I brought down the shadows, highlights, and even the midtones just slightly on the main part of the video. And then I added a mask around the corners and I pretty much crushed the shadows completely. That way I stand out in the middle and you pretty much have no signs of the noise that was in the sides. Okay, this last part I will call the nuclear option because you really don't want to use this a lot. It is very simple, but it takes up a lot of time to render and it's very CPU intensive. But there's a program called Neat Video and I will just show you a little bit about what it can do. Now, I didn't even actually use this when I posted this video, but you can see a lot of noise. I had the original EOS R up to 2000 ISO here, and you can see a whole lot of noise. And then with a neat video, this is what you can do. And I could even push it further, but you might start looking plastic if you do that. But it's a substantial, huge change, and you can see it in these clips right here. I hope this has answered your question or at least given you a little bit more insights. There's always more to learn and I know at times it can seem overwhelming or at least it does for me, but keep practicing and watching channels like The Ordinary Filmmaker and you'll get as good as you want to be. Thank you all for letting me join you again and until next time, back to you, Tom. Thanks a lot, Moving Matt, for your insightful answer. Guys, please go ahead and pause the video right here. Go over and subscribe to Moving Matt's channel. I love what Moving Matt's doing. I love the research he puts into his stuff. And someday he's going to be a really big guy. So he would certainly appreciate your help subscribing and helping him get just that one extra inch closer to a thousand subscribers and getting monetized. And now for our next question. Joe Doc asks, which scenario gives you a more blurred background? The 70 millimeter F 2.8 or the 105 millimeter F 4? Well, Joe Doc, there's really three components here. The first is aperture how wide open your lens can shoot. The second is the distance from the camera to the subject, and the second is the distance from your subject to the background. First, let's take a look at this slide once again. In this slide here, we can see the aperture. In this case, the widest open this lens will go is 2.0, and it can go all the way down to f22. Now at f22, basically the entire scene is in focus, whereas at f2, that's when you have the shallowest depths of field, and it's easy to create that background blur. But Here's the problem. I'm currently shooting with a Canon RF 50mm f1.2, and let's say that camera was uh, two or three feet in front of me, and I was shooting at f1.2. Well, I would definitely blur the background. In fact, I would not only blur the background, but half of my head. My nose would probably be out of focus, my eyes would be in focus, and then probably from my ears all the way back to the rest of my head would blur right into the background. And that's not ideal. What you want to do is you want to you want to create a certain amount of motion or sort of bokeh or background blur. And I I find that quite often f2 to f2.8 is usually perfect for that. But once you set that up, then you also need to have the camera and the right distance from your subject, so that way your subject is perfectly separated from the background, which is what a lot of us want to do. Now there may be situations where you do want your subject to kind of blur into the background. Again. It's all about the results that you're trying to achieve, but it's also how far away the subject is from the background as well. So you, you would have the camera as far in front of you as you need to, to completely separate your subject from the background. But the depth of blur that you get or the amount of bokeh that you get will depend on how far away your subject is from the background. So the further your subject is away from the background, the more buttery, the more smooth your bouquet is going to be. So those are the three components that would go into it. So now let's take a look at the two lenses you specified. Now, maybe you were trying to confuse me here a little bit by using two separate focal lengths, but I'm going to completely disregard that. I'm going to look at the f-stop and the one that gives you an f2.8 is going to give you a much better uh, or a much shallower depth of feel than a lens that's shooting at f4. Name under construction asks, the Tamron 24-70 f2.8 has some focusing breathing issues. Does putting it on an adapter on the R5, moving it further away from the sensor,
do anything to help resolve that? I really love this question because it tackles focus breathing, something that most photographers and very few videographers, especially ordinary ones, really know what it is or how it can impact their work. But I'm not going to answer your question. Once again, I have the village mayor with us to answer this question. Mr. Mayor? Thanks, Simon, for letting me take this question. So let's take a step back for a bit, as I usually do with answering these questions. So focus breathing isn't something a person does when in labor. It refers to the way the lens changes its focal length while changing its focus. The changes are small but noticeable and happens to cheap to expensive lenses. As a photographer, focus breathing isn't so much of an issue because if the subject is not in focus, I would just have to take another shot. However, where it is a problem is focus stacking, because stitching together hundreds of photos would be difficult if the field of view changes, which is a symptom of focus breathing. However, focus breathing is a more serious issue for video as the constant in and out of zoom would be very distracting. And oftentimes you may not even notice the focus breathing until you view the video on a computer screen afterwards. One of the ways you might be able to tell if your lens is prone to focus breathing is by looking at the maximum magnification, which is the ratio of the size of the image on the image sensor relative to the actual size of the subject. Generally, the higher the magnification, the better it is. So as an example for my two RF lenses that I own, the 35mm f1.8 and the 85mm f2.0, the maximum magnification is 0.5, which is pretty high. Compared to the Tamron 24 to 78 2.8, um, I believe it is at uh, 0.2 times, which is much lower. A more visible test is to set your camera on a tripod or a sturdy base, and if you see the angle of view changing, or what you see in the viewfinder or screen constantly zooms in and out, then it actually has a lot of focus breathing. Now in your question, you mentioned uh, adapters. So I wasn't sure if you were thinking about a mount adapter like the EF to RF. However, if you're referring to extension tubes, uh, then that is actually one of the solutions that might work as the idea is to pull the lens a little further away from the camera's focal plane. So before you invest in a, an extension tube, um, I would look to see if you can rent one or uh, to try for yourself and to see if the focus breathing actually disappears. Um, now this, despite the other solution, is to uh, purchase lenses, uh, and when you do that, you look for the maximum magnification. So once again, I would like to thank Simon for the chance to answer such a great question. Thanks again, Mr. Mayor, for taking time out of your busy day to answer questions here on The Ordinary Filmmaker. And now, for our next question. Prash Half asks, on a lens designed for an APS-C, let's say it's a 35mm f1.4, I understand the effective depth of field is that of a full frame equivalent of 52.5 millimeters f1.8. However, could you throw some light onto as to whether there is a reduction in the number of light stops from 1.4 to 1.8? I, I love this question. It allows me to sink my teeth into something else that, well, something that can really help you improve your work. Uh, if you're starting out, if you're new, an ordinary filmmaker or photographer, this is very important. I made a very expensive mistake many years ago. I bought the Canon EF 100mm f2.8, and that lens at the time cost me about $2,000. I thought I was buying a great portrait lens. Portrait, portrait photography, you can shoot anywhere from about 50 millimeters up to 100, perfectly fine. But I didn't understand that the review was writing from the viewpoint of a full frame camera with 100mm, which on my 70D gave me the, well, 160 millimeters, which is great for catching, capturing portraits of gazelles or other wildlife, but not for people. Went back to the article and reread it and realized, well, there's my problem, but I was kind of stuck, so I learned to improve my macro photography. So what is very important, and most of us know this, that when we're buying a lens, if we're buying a 35 millimeter for a full frame, it's going to give us that look and feel we expect. But if we take that same 35 millimeter and put it on a crop sensor, it's still bringing in the same amount of light, but it's covering a smaller sensor, so it gives us a look equivalent to a 56 millimeter, not 52.5. So let me clarify a little bit here. When it comes to APS-C, Canon has a 1.6 crop, whereas Sony has a 1.5 crop. So since I'm comparing Canon equipment here, I'm going to use the 1.6 crop. So I've got the R5, I've got a lens on it, I've got it set to 35 millimeters, I've set the 
ISO to 150 and I've set the f-stop to 400 and I snap and I take my picture. Now I can take a same picture, the exact same framing, same lighting, same depth of field on the Canon 90D. But how do I do that? Well, it goes back to knowing that crop factor on Canon is 1.6, again Sony it's 1.5. So if I want to create that same look as a 35mm, I would need a lens that could give me essentially 22mm. And for my f-stop, well again I apply the crop there, instead of f4 I would need to set the f-stop on the 90D to 2.5, assuming the lens allows me to go to 2.5. And that's where you start to run into problems as you get into lower light situations, you might find that you can't create, can't create that situation. But as I'm sure you're, in, you're well aware of, once you open up that aperture, you're getting more light to come in. So at, at, you move from f4 to f2.5, you're going to get more light coming in. So now you need to adjust the ISO. And again, we apply the crop factor. It's a little bit more complicated math. It's your ISO value over the crop factor squared. So essentially, on the R5, I was shooting with 400 millimeters. On the 90D, you would need to set that to 150. And what you're going to get is pretty much the exact same photo. It's going to be framed more or less the same. And as long as the camera settings are same, the photo is going to look pretty much the same. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you're using a full frame camera like the R5 or some other high end camera, and you're using really high end glass, yes, it's going to be sharper. But I'm talking about, about from the viewpoint of creating the same frame, the same bokeh, the same light, the same look and feel. Yes, a better camera is going to give you better detail. It's going to give you better focus and sharpness from the center all the way to the edges through much of the focal range. So that is important to know. But keep in mind, if you are going to change from one lens to another, from one body to the other, know that when you're moving from full frame to APS-C, it's not the, just the crop factor on the lens. Like, for example, 35 millimeters, you're also affecting the f-stop and the ISO as well. Ali asks, I currently have a Canon R6 with the RF 35 millimeter f2.8 and the RF 50 millimeter f1.8. I'm looking to get the RF 70 to 200 f4 when it comes out next year. Do you think it's a good lens for outdoor video and photo, or can you recommend a lens? By the way, I'm not a professional photographer or videographer. Well, Ali, the 70 to 200 is a professional grade lens, and if you're a photographer, this is the focal length you want. You're going to want it as wide as you can get it, like an f2 or f2.8. For an ordinary filmmaker photographer, as you're saying you are, then this probably wouldn't be my first go-to lens, but again, it depends on what you're shooting, what look you're going for. Are you doing wildlife? Are you doing portraits? Um, how far away are you going to be from your subject? I need to know more from you, but maybe what I can do is help you understand what I look for in cameras and lenses, the look and feel that I'm going for. A lot of what I shoot really has a docu kind of look to it. I shoot at 30 frames per second. I want things to look on my TV screen, on my computer, how they look in real life. I want to replicate things as they are. And my first lens, the very first lens I bought, was the RF 24-105. This is a great focal length. It really gives me everything I need for most general purpose stuff. If I'm traveling, if I'm shooting my son, if I'm shooting family stuff, if I'm at a sporting event, you know, the 24-105 to can work very, very well for me. And it's an F4 version, so it's weather sealed, and that's really handy too. But there are times when the F4 just doesn't allow me to separate the subject from the background nearly as much as I would like. Now it is better than an APS-C, so I still get some sort of depth of field, or blur background I should say. When the 24-105 isn't enough for me, well that's when I default to the RF 50mm F1.2, and the EF version's perfectly fine. But Here's the problem with shooting with the 50mm, the focus motor is loud. I cannot shoot video where I want to capture the audio if the mic is mounted to the camera. So when I'm using the 50mm f1.2, I have to mic up my son or whatever my subject is and I've got two of these task cams so I can mic up to two people. Or if you're just going to delete the audio and put down music later, not a problem. And so those are really my workhorses. It's what I use most of the time. I still want to get the 15 to 35. I still want to try it out, but I'm one of those people who doesn't really want to have to keep removing lenses unless I absolutely have to. I should have called myself the lazy filmmaker or lazy photographer, but that's probably already been taken. 
that's a good name. If it hasn't been taken, take it. I think it's really cool. The other lens that I got, and I had the 15 to 35 and the 800 millimeter, both RF lenses for review on the same week or the same two weeks. And I was expecting to love the 15 to 35, which is a terrific lens, but I didn't, I didn't love it. I liked it. Um, it it's kind of like a lawyer. Um, they dress up, they look sharp, they're very smart, but they're not usually the life of the party. The 800 millimeter was. And one of the things with Canon too is right now on the RF cameras, like the R5 and the R6, when you're shooting anywhere from like 24 millimeters and lower, you're generally getting a bit of a wobble. And it's not too terribly bad, depending on if you've got a lot of movement going on the scene, you're going to be focused on the subject rather than the wobble. And, but still, it is there. Whereas the 800 millimeter, wow. Allie, this, I cannot stop talking about this lens. It's always exciting me. Um, I, I've only been able to use it a little bit since I got it because I got it around November or Black Friday. And I think we've had maybe two to three clear nights since I got it. And I think maybe a few others where I could get a few clear patches where I could go out and shoot the moon and Saturn and Jupiter. It's a terrific lens for shooting the moon, Saturn and Jupiter. It's great for wildlife. It's great for all that sort of stuff. So I'm, I, I think to me that has got to be, I would say it's the lens of the year. I would say it's my most enjoyable lens. I don't use it the most, but wherever I can find an opportunity to use that lens, I take it out. Um, I, every, every now and then I go on a walk and I'll usually bring that one with me, even though it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was able to catch some beavers. I thought they were beavers anyways. Once I had the lens, set up on the camera on the tripod and I was shooting, I realized these are beavers. Where's that flat tail? Where's those webbed feet? They were muskrats. Still, it was fun. Um, the lighting was terrible because it was heavily overcast. It was snowing and it was three o'clock in the afternoon with the sun setting in just over an hour and a half. So I was working and I had the RF um, two times extender on there. So that really was not, I should have shot without the two times extender and it would have been just as good. So, but anyhow, that is my favorite lens. Um, in terms of what lens I want to get next, you know what? There is one, and this is probably because I'm doing the channel. I would love to get a 20 millimeter. And, well, no, I'd love to get a 16 or 18 millimeter lens, a prime, so I can do vlogging stuff, but there really isn't anything out there right now. So I'm kind of holding off. I do want to get an L series. Hopefully it's not a very expensive one. So that way I get some weatherproofing, the 800 millimeter, sadly isn't weather sealed so you do have to be careful when you go outside if you're going to be shooting wildlife you want to make sure you have some sort of cover so your gear is protected Mikel or michelle asks quick question at what distance were you from the muskrats it's a very good question so again this is referring back to the video that i shot a couple of weeks ago i didn't go out there with a tape measure because it's still boggy and i didn't want to fall through the ice and make for a rather, rather disappointing day. As you can see from this image here, I estimated at where the muskrat's dwelling was and where I thought I was standing. It looks to be about 101 meters, which works out to be, I think, a three, 333, 300, about 333 feet to about 340 feet. So yeah, it's, again, keep in mind, that's the 800 millimeter with a two times extender and shooting in cropped mode. Now, in hindsight, I should have just shot without, or I should have shot without the two times extender because there just wasn't enough light that day, especially here in Canada, up I think around the 43rd, 44th um, longitude or latitude line. Um, it, it's a real battle here. Unless you're shooting in the middle of the day and you don't have heavy cloud cover like I did, it's using the two times extender was just silliness, but still, lesson learned. Daniel asks, I want a really good camera to buy in 2021, like the EOS RP. Do you think it will hold up to other cameras in 2021? Well, my honest opinion of the RP and the EOS R is, well, they weren't doing a very good job of holding up against the competition back in 2018 when they were released, or I think 2018 for the EOS R. And if I'm not correct, the RP came out in 2019. These cameras were Canon's way of addressing, hey, we are going to be doing mirrorless and here's a couple of options for you. Enjoy these. These are your appetizers while we work on your main course. And the main course was the R5 and the R6, but Canon is not done. You're going to see a lot more cameras coming out in 2021. You're going to see at least two 
uh, entry level to low end cameras, then you're going to see some high end cameras. We're also going to see a couple of APS-C art system cameras too. So Canon's, I think by the end of 2021, you're going to have a much bigger, better picture of what Canon's mirrorless offering is going to be. But to answer your question, I would wait. I would wait till at least June. I think by June you will either see two new cameras on the market or at least an announcement. And what we're going to see is a new entry level R system camera designed to replace the EOS R. Sorry, the EOS RP. And it's actually going to be even cheaper. I think max the price of this thing is going to be $899 and that'll be the MSRP, although it could be lower and things like the EVF might be an optional attachment to help save on costs. Another camera is going to come out and it's going to be priced somewhere between the current price of the EOS R to the R6. And it's also going to be mid capable between the EOS R and the R6. I think that camera is going to make a lot of people very excited. Now, my view on the RP is I think it does a pretty good job. It's a great stills camera, but it's very, very lacking in video. Now, I don't know what Canon's going to do. Are they going to bring back the crop factor for these new cameras? Hopefully they don't. Canon has moved away from having a crop factor in video with the R5 and the R6. But sadly, all I'm giving you is conjecture. We don't know what specifications are going to be in these cameras. We do know they're coming. Canon Rumors has put them out as a CR2. So they are on the way. We're just going to have to wait and be a little bit more patient. I'd expect leaks to start coming shortly. Lap Family Movies asks more or less two questions. How about doing an R5 run test with IBIS wobbling and how bad is overheating? Well, let's address the IBIS wobbling first. I'm not planning on doing this because, well, it's been done to death. A lot of people have done it, as with the overheating. Now, one thing I can tell you is when I was shooting with the 15 to 35, you did notice a bit of a wobble. And sometimes when I shoot at 24 millimeters on my 24 to 105, again, I notice some wobble. I do hope that this gets better. Now, my eyes are tuned to notice imperfections in video because, well, it's part of my trade. But for a lot of people who watch my videos, the IBIS wobble isn't as bad. Not like it was when the R5 first came out. The IBIS wobble was pretty noticeable. If you've got a lot of movement in the frame, it's not as big of a deal, but it's definitely there. Now, as far as overheating goes, nothing has really changed since Canon released firmware 1.1 for the R5 and a 1.2 for the R6. The camera overheats. There's no way of getting around that. Unless, of course, you move to Canada or Siberia and you shoot outside a lot or you shoot my studio where it's about 60 degrees and then you're not going to get any overheating. And one thing I've noticed is all seriousness. If you do shoot and the ambient temperature is 60 degrees or less, you're not going to have any overheating in any of the modes. But it is there. If you're going to shoot in 70 degrees or, or anything above 60 degrees, there's going to be certain level of overheating. Canon put out a chart at 73, degree, 73 degrees Fahrenheit or about 22 to 23 degrees Celsius which states that in 4K HQ, you're going to get about 30 minutes, 40 minutes of record time. In 120 frames per second, you're going to get about seven and a half minutes. In 8K, it's going to be around 15 minutes. But the hotter you get, the more those times really drop off. Now, there are ways to jimmy this thing. You can open up the case. You can fabricate a little piece of uh, metal, such as copper, that can sit between underneath the circuit board and attach the case. And there was one gentleman who did this and recording in normal room temperatures, studio temperatures, he was able to record in 8K raw endlessly. I don't recommend doing that. I don't recommend any of these hacks. The R5 does have its limitations. And if you're going to be in a warm climate, and you're looking at shooting video and you're concerned about overheating, um, I'd be very concerned. This is not going to be the camera for you, not for video. For photos, yes, it'll work perfectly well. But if you're in the tropics or in areas where it's very hot all the time, than maybe a camera like the Sony a7S III or a cinema camera that has better heat management. JC asks, what's your opinion on external hard drives, SSDs versus RAID and NAS? Ah, uh, that's, that's a really good question because I'm, even right now I'm smiling because I used to have a NAS, or sorry, I used to have um, a, an actual server um, with a hardware RAID controller and drives and everything, and it was super fast, but I had a failure and it was catastrophic. There is no one solution that's going to provide you with um, protection. You're going to need to use multiple different um, devices. So I'm going to tell you what I use. Right now, I'm just using standalone Samsung SSDs. Not the Pro grade, but um, the mid grade, the Evos. And I'm using one terabyte, two terabytes, and four terabytes. And basically every year I buy a new one. 
And this year I had to buy a four terabyte because of, well, I'm using 4K now. And what I use that for is my working disk, but I also use that for my stuff that I want to keep around for a long time. All my YouTube videos, they're deleted pretty much after it's been uploaded and published. Once it's published, it's deleted. It's gone. I cannot afford to buy enough uh, SSDs or enough NAS or servers to be able to house all my content. It would get prohibitively expensive. So then I asked myself, well, okay, so what do I want to keep? So my family videos, some of my client stuff that's very important to me. So what I do is periodically, I just back those up off to another device. SSDs are fast enough that if I need to recover anything, it really doesn't take a whole lot of time. I've used NAS, I've used RAID device, I've used RAID 5, I've used RAID 6. And you still need to back those up. So you still need other drives and your costs can get really, really expensive. So the, the real question I have for you is, is what is your budget? What is important that you keep? And then build the appropriate system. I think RAIDs are one of the best systems out there. They give you the speed. You can actually use those cheap disks, um, hard drives. And if you do a large enough RAID array, you can get the speeds you need for editing. But you're still going to need to edit off SSDs and I'm using a Mac so the last thing I want to do is store everything on my internal SSD despite having such a huge speed of 3 gigabytes per second. The reason is if I have a failure I have no way of getting the information off that computer. I have to take it to Apple or some other service provider, wait for them to look at it, see if I can recover the content and then get it back. So what I do is I just don't keep anything on the internal drive when I'm using Macs. I use an external storage device, like I said, the Evo SSD. And what that allows me to do is if, let's say this Mac crashes, no problem. I've got three others in the house. They're a lot slower, but I haven't lost my work. I can just take that SSD, drag it over to another computer and continue editing. Because when I set up my projects, I tell Final Cut Pro that everything caching all the files, everything is going to be in the library, and the library is what is saved on the SSD. So again, I think RAIDs are great. They're going to cost you a lot more, uh, especially if you go with like um, an SSD RAID. I think those are really the way to go, but your, your costs really, really increase. Identify what stuff you need to keep and then build out the capabilities you need. So for me, um, budget is a huge impact to that, and that really stopped me from going NAS and RAID. Seth asks, I record, process, and upload every video in 4K UHD. For some reason, 4K never becomes available on YouTube. Am I missing something in the uploading process in order to activate 4K? I was mortified I double back to check at least 25 of my videos, all capped at 1080. There's absolutely, positively, in 4K, that's what I'm shooting in. What's up? I can't find any info on it. Everyone just says to wait. Well, everyone is wrong. It doesn't take days to convert. And I'm going to be honest with you, um, pretty well every video I've uploaded, usually it's 4Ks available, usually within under an hour, usually within half an hour. Uh, this video here, the, these, these are usually an hour long. It can take about an hour to two hours before it's fully processed. When it's fully processed, I've got my 4K, I've got my 1080, my 720, all of it. Now, I have had a video get stuck once. And so I just deleted it, re-uploaded it, and it was fine. Now I'm gonna tell you what I do in my workflow. Like you, I use Final Cut Pro, but I don't use Final Cut Pro to export, I use compressor. And when I compress, I use the, the setting built in that says YouTube, drag it down, compress it, and upload it. And I've never really had a problem other than those two times where I had to re-upload. I do remember when I first set up my channel, there was a bunch of check boxes where once you hit a certain milestone, YouTube would say, oh, congratulations, you can do 4K. Congratulations, you can do polls. Oh, congratulations, we're going to pay you for your hard work now. And I went back to try and find this, and they've changed the studio enough that I don't see those checkboxes anymore. It seems to be integrated. But I do remember that you did need to be monetized. You did need to get to 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of watch time within 12 months to be able to upload 4K videos and have them show up in 4K. So I'm, I'm not sure what your problem is. Um, you, you know, people saying, wait, well, you've got 25 videos. That's not the problem. There's something else going on here. Let me know. Are you monetized? Are you, do you, have you ever had 4K videos showing up? Do you have the necessary number of watched hours? Can you try compressor? Um, look, I really think compressor is great. Yes, you do have to pay for it. You might have a trial, 
But what I like about compressor is sometimes I, especially after vacation, I've got a whole lot of videos. And what I do is I'll drag all 60 or 100 of them, however many I have, into compressor. And then I'll just drag over ProRes 422. And every single one of those, once I click Start Batch, will be converted to Apple ProRes 422. So I love that batch processing. Plus, if I've got multiple videos in Final Cut that I want to get published in one day, again, I can send multiple videos to Compressor at the same time. It'll work on those, and then I can still use my system for other stuff in Final Cut. So, I'm, And I'm also curious, too, um, to get more information to, but to find out from you what actually works. I know this has got to be frustrating. Um, I use Final Cut. A lot of people do. No problem. But I'm wondering if it might be with Compressor, because there could be some other settings you have. But... Let's talk in the comments and see if we can't work through this one. Brian asks, when I'm using the Canon R5, when I use it in studio, every time I shoot, the screen is blown out for a few seconds before it looks normal again. Now, while blown out, it makes it impossible to focus and is also annoying. The actual image captured is great, but it slows me down from shot to shot. What setting do I change to stop this? I came from a DSLR. This is my first mirrorless camera. Okay, I, I'm a little curious here. When you're shooting in the studio, are you using manual focus or autofocus? Because here's what I think might be going on. When I was shooting upstairs earlier, I set my lens to manual focus and I shot and it was bang, bang, bang. There was no delay whatsoever. There was no, I wouldn't say it was blown out. I'd say what the, it looks like the exposure setting was jumping about three to five stops ahead and it was making the image a lot brighter. But as soon as I turned on autofocus, and again, I was shooting inside, I would press down the shutter and it would brighten up the scene three to five stops, blowing it away, essentially, replicating what you're getting. And I think what is happening in that scenario, because autofocus is on, in low light, what the camera is doing is it's bumping up the exposure a bit so it can get the autofocus, then dropping it down and taking the shot. And I think that's what's going on and from everything I've been seen with the camera. I've been using it for almost six months now, day in and day out, primarily as a videographer and not a photographer. So I'd love to hear from some of the other photographers with the R5 watching this channel. Is what I'm inferring here happening? Is it because of the autofocus is set to auto? Sorry, the focus is set to auto and the camera is bumping up the brightness so it can go out there, test the focus or properly nail the focus and then drop things back down because as you say the photos are looking fine so this is what I noticed with the autofocus on yes it happened but with manual focus it doesn't so let me know in the comment section down below if you're using manual or automatic focus. Clive asks what's the best gimbal under $400 for mirrorless cameras? Well simply put uh, under $400 I'd be looking at the uh, Weeble S and the DJI Ronin uh, the essentials you add on taxes and a few other essentials or extra batteries and before you know it you're 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 going through that four hundred dollars pretty quickly and the way i recommend purchasing them yeah you're going to spend more than four hundred dollars i'm going to change the question around a little bit and say you know what understand the capabilities you're looking for i've got the crane 2s what i love about it is how easy it is to calibrate well not even calibrate how easy it is to just use each time it's it's so heavy grade you've got it's solid metal. You've got carbon fiber to help reduce weight. It's not as weight light as these other units, but can handle heavy payloads. And you might think, well, you know, the, the R5 with a 50 millimeter on there is more than fine on the Weeble. Yes, but you see, I can swing that R5 around. And what you, what people don't often realize is when you're moving these things around, the G forces you're putting on the camera is increasing the load. So that initial four pounds, as you put it into movement is increasing the pressure, increasing the strain, increasing the effective weight due to G-forces on the motors. And the Crane 2S with its larger motors, I never heard those motors. I never heard a sound out of them. It never seemed to struggle. Uh, balancing was a breeze. It was just, it's one of those things where, you know, right out of the box, other than, you know, the, the setup, which can take 30 minutes. Once I'd done the calibration, I never needed to do calibration again. Balancing it, getting it going each time was a breeze. And the quick release plate is great. Um, and here's some other capabilities that I really liked about the, the Crane 2S. We've got really powerful motors. You've got more accessories you can add on to it. You've got two accessory mounts. You've got that carbon fiber handle. You've got that vertical mount. 
Uh, it's really great access. Uh, the locks are terrific and it's just buttery smooth and it's so easy to operate. I think this is going to be easier to operate than the Weeble. So if budget is your driving concern, then yes, look to some of these entry level units. But I would really recommend putting out on paper, uh, look at my R5, R6 and EOS R review and you can see how I came up with a complex set of capabilities. Do the same for a gimbal because the last thing you want to do with one of these things is buy something that isn't powerful or too powerful because trying to sell them on a secondary market can be a real pain and it can be a very costly mistake. This is one of those things where it's very easy to have buyer's remorse. So um, my personal view, the Crane 2S is, is terrific. Yes, it isn't light. Um, it can be a bit of an issue in certain modes, depending on how far out you hold the camera. But uh, if you look at my re review when I did it on the, um, the Crane 2S, I was just uh, stunned at how easy it was to use and how the weight didn't seem to be a factor in any way whatsoever. David asks, any news on the R1? Yes, there's lots of news on the R1. Uh, we got a couple of rumors coming out or that came out last year. And so let's sum up some of the biggies. It's going to have a global shutter. It's going to have a new image sensor. It's going to have a groundbreaking new autofocus system that is more advanced than what's in the R5 and the R6. And it's going to have the fastest frame rate for a stills camera ever from Canon. And it's going to be available in the first half of 2021. Now, this is based on leaks that we had in October. I do believe the Olympics are going to go ahead this year. I'm pretty sure that every athletic team, anybody involved in that is going to have their COVID shots. So I, I'm pretty sure that's going to go ahead. And I'm pretty sure that this camera is going to be out in the wild so that it can be working hard at the Olympics. So when are the Olympics? Well, usually they're around the 23rd of July. And the second half starts in July. So I wouldn't be surprised if these cameras come out very early July or late June. Again, the information we got is based on rumors. I don't know too much about this camera, but what I can tell you is this it is a stills hybrid camera. It's focused on stills, high frame rates. It'll do some video, but don't expect this to be a very, very powerful video camera. In fact, it might be less video capable than the R5, which is not normally the case. Usually the one series camera is more powerful in every way for video than the five series. But that's just speculation on my part. It's just conjecture. We need to get leaked specs. We need to see more information or even a development announcement before we really know. But that's it for now. As soon as I hear more information, I'll let you know. But now for our last question. Nick asks, with AI showing up in more and more in the photo editing scene, are there any video editing software out there with significant AI and how helpful and effective is it? Any examples of footage with and without? Well, Nick, AI is going to become more and more prevalent in uh, video editing software. It's not there so much right now. Like the one thing I'd really love AI to be able to help us out in is when we bring all our content in, to be able to have it analyze, look at the content, be able to sort it, be able to say, you know, these are the people or actors in this scene. This is what the scene looks like. To be able to grab metadata out of it, I think would be very handy. But there's other information I think would be very handy as well. Um, I can very easily see uh, artificial intelligence helping us with um, color balancing and color correction. This could save us a huge ton of time. I don't expect the video editing software to do our work for us, but as a wizard, as a guide to help us get there a whole lot quicker, yeah, I really see it being able to help us huge there. What about object removal or the opposite of object removal? helping us with masks, to be able to put objects into the frame, to be able to do tasks like masking, which can take an awful amount of time or certain animations, AI could really, really help us out. But for now, what's involved in Final Cut Pro? I'll be honest with you, I haven't really checked because, well, you're the first person to ask me on this, but I sense that unlike photos with smartphones, with the video editing software, we're the AI isn't a huge component now, but I would get ready over the next couple of years and we're going to see AI play a much bigger role in flagship video editing software. I should have said Happy New Year to you and your family right at the beginning, but for some reason I forgot. And it's only what, January the 6th right now? That's the day I'm recording this. So a Happy New Year to you and your family. May 2021 be 
a much better year may you be healthy and may things go very well for you now just a few things before i close out today's video ces is coming up on the 11th to the 14th of january and i expect some major announcements i wouldn't be surprised if nikon at least teases us but i'm really expecting sony to come forward here with their flagship stills hybrid camera and the reason for that is well sony keep in mind is a is primarily a consumer electronics company rather than a camera company so i'd really expect them to drop some news there about an 8k flagship camera the a9 mark iii but what about nikon will nikon tease us nikon canon they're usually not use they don't usually use ces to drop this sort of stuff i wouldn't be surprised if we hear something from nikon very very soon maybe after sony's made their announcement we'll just have to wait and see but i think an announcement sometime in january is very very likely for nikon could even be likely for canon with the r1 i don't know it's been very very quiet usually by now it expects some sort of leaked specifications uh, canon is not very good at keeping things quiet usually when we have a major camera coming out we will get leak specs at least a month or three months ahead of time oh and one last thing before i close things off my hair is getting a mess and there's not a thing i can do about it we're in shutdown again so you're going to see my hair grow crazy and wild and uh going to be a little bit unkempt but you know what I'm going to have to honor the lockdown, stay home, stay safe. And, well, it's winter here too, so it's cold. So probably not a bad idea to stay inside. But that's it for now. Don't forget to subscribe for your chance to win the Cinco Lab S6E and M3 shotgun microphone. I'm going to be giving these two prizes away once the channel reaches 20,000 subscribers and just about 600 subscribers. It's not far away. Then for every 10,000 or so subscribers from there on out, I'll be offering up a better and more expensive prize all the way to 100,000 subscribers, at which point I'll be offering up a brand new Canon EOS R5 full frame mirrorless camera. And on that bombshell, thanks so much for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. Happy New Year, and we'll see you soon.